how can you influence people to buy something or do something mm. so there's plenty of people that just get likes or followers because they've got a nice body but i'm like you probably shouldn't try and sell one-to-one -one coaching because you've you've got no like but you probably haven't got enough trust for that person to know that you'd be good at coaching but the bigger your brand or bigger your brand equity you have a larger following means you get more leads means you get a higher conversion rate on sales calls means even if you've got an inferior product or service they will stay longer because you've got fan boys and fan girls mm. All right, Luke, welcome to the potty. Thanks for having me, Alex. Always a, a nice thing to actually meet someone in person. Obviously, we've been connected over social and uh, been watching your videos lately. Very consistent on the videos. Thank Pumping you. Pumping out a lot of great quality content, which which I love, right? And um, that was one of the things that really struck me about you is like your attention to detail, your quality of content. And I think it's probably testament to how long you've been in the industry. Like you've been in the industry longer than I have. I've only been doing this about six years. You've been in the industry much longer, doing online coaching since 2012, I believe. But yeah. when people ask you, like, what do you do? That must have changed a lot over the years. But what do you currently say when someone asks you, what do you do? Normally, if people ask me and they don't really know me, I, I say I'm unemployed, as in I couldn't be employed by someone anymore. So, you, you know, it's like you you go through the transition of being employed and then you have your own business. So jokingly, I say unemployed. Uh, but I suppose now I'd, I'd consider myself someone that's been in the, the fitness, the online fitness game for a while. Like people, you'll see on my content, like the OG. Yep. I didn't call myself the OG. You have other people, I, I consider it, it could be like the originator, the original gangster, the old git, whatever term you want. It, I think of it as more of like being one of the first to start online coaching back in 2012, as you said. So now I feel like you go through different seasons. So for me now, going forward, I'm just a, a personal brand helping, wanting to help a younger version of myself. Mm. So someone that's already, I don't want to work with people that are starting off in their online coaching journey. I want to work with people that enjoy creating content and really want to build a personal brand that probably already making 10K per month. Okay. And just going, this is how I would build my business if I went back with all the use of automation technology. And yeah, so recently I took a year off. So I'm sort of coming back out of that year, that sabbatical. So I'm just looking to partner with a few people to help them build their brand and business. So some of my strap lines on the content, which I've stopped now, and we maybe can discuss why, is build your brand, build your business. Mm. So I feel like that is gonna be, and you still, I'm seeing it more and more now. It's like build your personal brand, build your personal brand. And over my sort of evolution of business, my my businesses come and go but your you as an individual will evolve and i was like if only i continue to build my personal brand i could have so many more opportunities and it wouldn't matter if i closed the business down or if i pivoted so i suppose now nah, yeah in short i've been in the game for a long period of time i focus on if there's a way to make money from online fitness i've made that money um so yeah now i'm just looking to be a little bit selective in my older age with who i want to work with um, and what I want to do with my time, so putting out content and helping people that are already there, but just help them win quicker and bigger. Mm. So, I'd love to get into the personal branding in a second, because mm -hmm. I think this can be quite ambiguous yeah. as to what personal branding actually is, what it means, why it's important, why you think it's key, especially if you're past just starting out and you obviously want to build a much bigger business with maybe spin-off products, yeah. which typically come with having a personal brand. Um, but before we get into that, I'm genuinely curious about these other businesses that you've had up until this point. So from from my research, you've you've had six businesses. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but I'd love to just skim through those just to, to understand what it is that you've been doing over the last, what, 10 plus years. Yeah, so first business I, well, started with online coaching. So my girlfriend told me she was pregnant via WhatsApp, and just a photo of a um, pregnancy stick. Oh, she just sent you this? Thing. Yeah, just sent it that to me it. and then decided to have a nice deep bath for 30 minutes while I'm like frantically going, what the hell's going on? So just basically dropped the bomb and then yeah. it. <laughs> so I call that, that was my, uh, people say a successful person, success is in the eye of the individual, like people have different levels of what success is. Yeah. But I feel like people that do something with their lives or are a success in their own eyes or other people's eyes have like this fuck this event. We're like, oh shit, this wasn't planned. Yeah, and you've was, got to think on your feet. Yeah, and that was sort of the catalyst. So then I started doing online coaching, which was basically I was getting in shape before my first season, just turned 11. Um, 
And the first 10 people I took on, it was body transformation, 10 people, 100 pounds for eight weeks. And I think eight of them were from school friends. But at the time I was like, I'm gonna be a dad, so it's gonna be hard to get in shape or be in shape when you're a dad, just based on people you speak to. Uh, and that's sort of where the online coaching came in. Because at the time I was working as a sports lecturer. Mm. At, so you weren't uh, doing personal training like most people do before they get into online coaching? No, I, I consider myself a failed in-person personal trainer. So when I was at uni, I did a gym instructor course in two weeks. I then started working at Bannatine's gym every Saturday. After I finished my sports science degree, I then had to do a level three. So I was doing like, it was 2020, back in the day, you do 20 hours fitness instructor, 20 hours PT. And I didn't like my time being dictated by other people. And that's like why I feel like, as I said, well, I'm unemployed. Natural business owner mentality. Yeah, and then that sort of, when she told me she was pregnant, that was a catalyst. So yeah. that was sort of my first met, like branch of making money for just my personal brand, Luke Johnson PT. How did you get those clients? That was just Facebook. Okay. So back in the day, Twitter was fairly popular. So I had probably 4,000 Twitter followers at the time. And I was doing like fit tip of the day and stuff like that. But going through like principles, when I needed to make money, it was Facebook posts. And I basically did like an eight week bro diet, shaved my, I'm half Greek. So I shaved like racks off my chest hair. You're half Greek? Yeah, half Greek. Oh. Baby all up, um, took some, had my sister's husband now take photos he was doing photography and i just posted them online me with a ice cream lemon ice and then me after about 300 push-ups in fairly decent shape pumped and people yeah people were just like can you coach me and, and like, this was just one post yeah just one post friends on facebook people you went to school with yeah which is actually probably where most people's initial clients are going to typically come from right when you first start out with any venture i know when i started my business it was like who do i know who can i reach yeah. out to who do i uh, who can I reach out to that I know and say, hey, I've got this thing. Are you interested in this thing? Same thing, right? Facebook post, people you know, they yeah. jump on it. There was no personal page. It was just your literal personal profile. Yeah. And that was the catalyst. As I said, I think I took on 10 people, probably seven or eight of them were old school friends, but they're not really your friends, but they were Distant your Facebook. Friends. Yeah, like acquaintances. Your, they're your Facebook friends. Yes, yeah? virtual your, friends. Yeah, virtual friends. And then... I reached out to Alan Aragon and was like, do you want to come over to the UK? He ignored me. I sent him another email, he said yes. So then within a weekend, I made 29 grand in a weekend and my salary at the time is probably 33,000 pounds. So how do you go from doing these eight weeks, it was eight weeks for 100 quid, Yeah. to then making 29K? I just asked. You asked more money or you got no, more I, people? I just created a better vehicle. Okay. I used someone else who had a brand. Mm -hmm. So during that time, I was still taking on clients. And I think, yeah, I reached out to Alan and because I didn't start Shredded by Science. That was my first coaching company. So that's like another business. Got it, got it, got it. But at oh, yeah, the time, missing the context as to his Yeah, so it's like there to there. So in between that, and I'll tell you about the Shredded by Science thing. So Luke Johnson PT and then Shredded by Science. But at the time, I was sort of going through that transition of being like learning to generate level two, level three, which is a piece of shit. And then um, Joseph Agu told me of Alan Aragon and his research with you. And I was like, oh, this is science stuff. This is different to what I've been taught. So then out of my curiosity thing, I just emailed him because every business I've created has always been to just try and scratch an itch or I would just want to know more. And at the time you're thinking 2013, there wasn't anyone coming over from the States to the UK. So then I do, I just, I just did it. I don't, and this is like coming full circle where I'm going back to those earlier scrappy days where it was just me. And he said, yes. So I'm like, I don't know anything about putting on fitness events. And once, once he said yes, and this is the power of momentum, I looked at who he's had research papers with and reached out to them. Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, Dr. Eric Helms. And my email was, I'm the guy that's managed to get Alan Aragon to agree to come over to the UK to do a conference. Would you be interested? So I didn't wait to find out if the event would be a success or not. I didn't even know what to do. I just learned as I was doing. So I've gone from a lecturer to an online coach to now putting on fitness events and sending 100, like we, I think it was just under 100 people that attended. And it was what, 300, 350 pounds for the weekend. So when Alan said yes, I was just like, right, I'm just gonna go. I asked Brad, then I asked uh, Eric Helms. 
and they all went back to Alan and was like, who's this Luke Johnson guy? Because no one knew who the hell I was. Mm. Yeah, you were coming up in the game. And that was that was influencer marketing without even knowing what influencer marketing was. It yeah, wasn't even pre, a thing. Pre-Instagram. Yeah, and it was just going, you have a following. I have nothing, but I'm associated with you now. And therefore, people, my brand sort of elevated fairly quick. Kind of like of a them. domino though, right? Because yeah. once you get one, it then becomes Two, the three. leverage for the and I'm not waiting number two number three. I'm not waiting to be like, oh, will it work or will it not work? I'm just go, I find go a way, in. and it just be like, I just need to learn. Okay, how do I create a website? How do I take tickets? What do I use for ticket sales? How do I? And I use scarcity and urgency without it being a thing mm. or knowing what it was, which was there was a hundred people, and the date was here. So urgency was the date. Scarcity was there was only 100 spaces, but then I also did a VIP thing. So there'd be VIP tickets, limited number that would get front row seats. And then there was another upsell. Well, I didn't even know what an upsell was, mm. which was if you want dinner with Alan Aragon, you pay even more money. So it was that thing where you're not, I was clueless, but I was just using my gut instinct and going, how do I get people to sign up? And how can I get people to sign? Because we'd probably put on ticket sales. I say it's the beautiful thing about that which doesn't work really nowadays because of the freely available content. But how can I sell that? I was selling thin air. Like I didn't have to pay for the venue. I didn't really have to pay for the flights until I started collecting money. So it's just all a phase of eight weeks out. We're going live. Here's a waiting list. Send the money. So mm -hmm. I was selling thin air before any outgoings were actually was there. So there wasn't really much risk of that. And yeah, as I said, just using momentum. So ended up just making yeah, like my salary as a lecturer in a weekend. And then at that time, I'd been in the online coaching game for a year and I was like, there's a certain type of person that does well for one-to-one -one online coaching. This is pre-COVID online coaching. None of this fucking Zoom or Skype doing star jumps on it. And it was young dudes that wanted to get shredded. That already trained, that already liked tracking on my fitness pal. So when it was Luke Johnson PT, I took everyone, which I think is what most people do, whether you're in person or online, you try and take on everyone but you're doing them a disservice. And it's, when you've got a specific target market, you can have really specific systems and you can have a thriving like group because everyone's similar. Same wave. They're on the same wavelength. They don't need their hand holding. Mm. They just want someone to take ownership of their programming, their nutrition. And that's when shredded by science. So at that time I stopped reading research papers. I was like, oh crap, I need to learn about marketing now. I need to learn about sales. And similar to fitness industry that I call it like bro marketing as well. So there's a lot of stuff where it's like, this is normally 999 pounds, but it's not, well, it's normally dollars. Uh, but now today it's only like $7. And I was like, who? And because my target market shredded by science, shredded basically the context was only young men knew what it meant. And by science repelled idiots. So a lot of our content we put out, we launched on Facebook really. And uh, we'd put scientific like references to PubMed in the days where you wouldn't be like your reach wouldn't be wouldn't suffer because of that so the content we put out only really appealed to a certain type of person and those were the people that we could coach and shredded by science we went from me i then took on another coach under luke johnson pt brand but it didn't really work if there's company like a personal brand if there's coaches underneath that yeah because people want to work with you if it's been positioned as you yeah so then we launched um then it ended up going to 12 coaches all over the world and we've coached like thousands of, of um, clients. But then the business model changed. So during that time, I launched Elite Fitness Mentoring because I'm going, cool, I can make a lot of money from this in-person stuff, but can I replicate that online? Are we talking about the events again now? Yeah, so back, so it's sort of like Luke Johnson PT, uh, events, shredded by science. So the reason I come at shredded by science was when Eric Helms agreed to come over. Yep. And I was trying to think of a name for my new business mm. to target those young men that wanted yep. to get shredded. And then I tied in, this is another play, by accident. Well, not by accident, but it, it worked pretty well. It was shredded by science. My new company is bringing Eric Helms over because he was, obviously he's a natural bodybuilding prep coach. And again, that association with Eric with the new formed company with the name. So originally we had the Shredded by Science domain name, but we were only gonna sell tickets on that. And I just took that domain name and then was like, no, Shredded by Science, the new company is bringing over Eric Helms to do the seminar. 
and then that's when yeah we went from three coaches to 12 coaches we did mem like a membership we did group coaching programs i think before anyone else we sold some guides we teamed up with a influencer and sold guides with that as well and but during that time so i've got shredded by science i launched elite fitness mentoring because i was like how can i make money online from these experts because now i've got in with them free i've now got access to more and more people so we we launched elite fitness mentoring and it was a, a monthly subscription i love recurring revenue and uh, i think it was like 39 pound or 49 pound a month i think we ended up to about 400 members on that and that was pretty much just doing webinars with these guest speakers coming on board yeah like molly galbraith dr mike zerdos greg knuckles and do they just get cut is that how you divvied it up? Yeah, how I'm trying you, to think. How did you figure out who gets what? Because obviously some names are bigger than others. I would think it was just, a, I'm trying to think of what it was, but I think it might have just been a flat rate. I'll pay you £300 or something like that to do a talk. Okay, got it. And then whatever's on top is your margin for yeah setting up all the logistics and, and marketing yeah, it. Yeah, managing everyone. The and you're the one driving all the traffic, but they're pulling traffic because of their names. It's a, yeah, it's a one-two. So it's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to do a talk here this thing if you want to sign up here's the link mm. so again that was when content wasn't that freely available we're looking at 2014 probably then 2014 2015 yeah. this is like pre when youtube was big yeah and pre instagram instagram was about 2014 13 yeah so like surely then when information became more accessible for free supply and demand that then changes then you the have demand, to pivot demand for that service right yeah so most of my businesses i'd probably say only say one of them failed which one? The supplement company. Okay. Which we'll get that's, that's hard to, to crack. Yeah, and I can just tell, like, don't do it. Or I, I, I can explain where, where it failed. But. So that's the next one after. So yeah, yeah Shredded by Elite Science. Fitness mentorship. Elite Fitness Mentoring. And then, then it was hard because you're trying to run two different brands. Yeah. Split focus. Yeah. So then, that's why I said it didn't really fail. Then it became like SBS Elite. So we just rebranded it. So rather than having two different brands, two different Facebook pages, Instagrams, et cetera, it just had one. So it sort of evolved back into that. But then, as is said, like when content becomes more and more available, there's more supply, less demand for paying for it. So um, with in 2015, we launched the SBS Academy. So you think I went from a college lecturer, well, I went from sports science, personal trainer, college lecturer, putting on fitness events, doing online coaching as a team now. And the, t the company was making money, but when you're VAT registered and you've got to pay tax and you, you're you starting off, so the first coach I took on got a 75% split, then it was 70% and then later on it was like a pay, like 50% and it went up. But all of the money was going to the coaching. So when I sat down, I was like, yeah, I don't have to do anything because I built all the systems, but for this business model to bring in millions that I want, I would need to have hundreds of coaches and they're hard to come by especially when your brand you're so pressured on the brand and i've always been precious about the shredded by science brand and um i just went back to you either complain about something or you do something about it so i always go back to the 21 year old luke on the gym floor that had a sports science degree and a level three qualification and didn't know what the fuck to do to talk to people to like business marketing so then that's when I created the SBS Academy. Again, scratching my own itch. I went to Helms again and Dr. Mike Zurdos and said, I want you to create a module on coaching powerlifters and coaching physique athletes, which again were fairly timely around 2015 to 2017. And I'll pay you a split. To split of any clients All that sign up to it. Yeah, so it was a year long academy. But I think when we first launched it, it was 899. And then we did like an early bird price, paying for pay monthly version. So obviously monthly it went a bit up. But then I think we ended up around probably average sign up fee based on monthly was about £1,500. So from 2015, 2018, so that's when I pivoted, still the same brand, but we were no longer coaching young dudes to get shredded. We were educating personal trainers, already qualified personal trainers, but in the science-based version with more to do with the actual practical application. And I did a module on like setting up a fitness business and, and more of that. It wasn't as in depth as I look at it now, but then we needed to have two intakes per year. So we ended up on average, first intake we had about 110, then it went down to like 85. And then after that, I changed my mindset around and like the strategy 
and we'd get 185 people like in the last three intakes and each that, round each yeah, every six months yep okay so you can do do the maths 1500 quid yep 185 times twice a year and that's when i started making money or the company where it weren't it was far more profitable and yeah that was from 2015 2018 and then stupidly i would rebranded again yeah because or slightly different business because i suppose the intentions were different so then we launched personal trainer collective yeah and this in, is where i think i first discovered you actually yeah so shredded by science is my baby and i use the example of personal training collective being like you rebranded it's still sort of your baby but it's like you've had a new you've got a new wife and she's come with another kid <laughs> interesting and, way and that, that is it. the way it feels yeah you've still got that connection but it's not your own it's a little bit more distant and the reason why i rebranded and i was going for it for a while was shredded by science was young dudes that wanted to get shredded if we wanted to be like a and at this time there was more academies propping up i was like there needs to be some there needs to be like a qualification behind it which the academy was but it didn't make it didn't fit what it was in training education like shredded by science even though now i look back and i'll be like it's a name it had a good brand you should have kept with it but my intentions then were level two and level three were fairly crap and on a few of the last intakes we teamed up with a training provider and we was getting feedback from the students and i was like shit and i was like well the qualification is bad but the actual company delivering it and like the customer service was bad as well so then my intentions were pure my thing with personal trainer collective is rather than you going with another training provider to do your level two level three and failing within the first year because the lack of business advice and support. yeah what we're going to do is we're start offering the level two level three and i thought we could do the same business structure of two intakes per year but where we've gone from just focusing on training education we've now gone to you could be a mum that's kids have gone to school you could be a student that's just finished you could be so the target market was so diverse now that it was hard to use the same con the same marketing strategy because mm. i used to look at all these training providers and i'd be like cool we've got combined all of them together in the uk we've got more followers than all of them combined and the intentions were well as in we do level two level three but they had to do pt core so i honestly believe like pt core is the best qualification out there for personal trainers especially like new ones so the intentions were we're delivered a level two level three we stopped that now but in two years, we had over 400 people do that. So that was fairly decent. But then I sort of fell out of the love of that because you're working with people at the really early stages of their career, different backgrounds. Who might not necessarily actually become people that work in the industry. Yeah. Because I used to work with an organization called Bluestone. Okay. And they were a small personal training provider where people could get educated on the on the weekend to be yeah, personal trainers, say. but most of them never became personal trainers. They never yeah. went into the industry because it was so accessible to get the qualification. Didn't necessarily mean they'd do anything with it. It was just like, oh, I'm into fitness. Why don't I just get educated? Yeah, I'll be a PT. There's yeah. so many part. There's so many PTs that are not actually PT in full time, and that was the that was the downside. That was when because um, a lot of even like Premier Global. And I think Lifetime, they don't do help because I did mine with Lifetime, my level three. They've stopped doing level two and threes. Premier gone out of business. And I stupidly, I used to look, the only way they got clients were SEO, which isn't as effective as it was back in the days, especially now with like chat GPT. But even before that, it was nowhere near as what it was effective uh, in, in the old days. And then PPC. But I didn't have the funds to play that game. And their game was, and the reason why they're out of business is PPC and discounts at the end of the month. But they would team up with a financial company where they they didn't care. They didn't care about people going through. They could be like, cool, you can go and pay £50 over five years or three years to is do that this like call. Is that like Not, it's not really. Do you know what I mean? The, yeah. Those finance companies I don't know what they like break things up. Yeah, it's more of of like a, a separate company and okay. they're basically finance it. So let's say you was paying it over three years, whatever it would be, uh, they would take a cut. So then they would give all of the money up front 
to the company minus about 20%. Okay. So they didn't really care because it was like, you can be on a monthly plan because we just want you to come in and bloated companies with salespeople and stuff like that. And I just didn't want to run a business like that. And my strategy of content marketing doesn't work because you've got so many different people that want to become a personal trainer. Where in the old days it worked. It was like, you're a personal trainer, here's some science-based content about personal training. And I think about when we used to survey them, 30% of people um, were fitness enthusiasts and they could still do the academy because they wanted to learn. There was no official qualification. So it was a lot harder. The, it, there's more administrative costs. There was more staffing to have that. There was booking events, assessors and stuff like that. And I, even though we had the PT core calls, I never, it never sat well with me because the level two, level three is a piece of shit and they changed the standards when we just launched it. So that was another probably 60, 70 K additional business expense that I had to do because we had to refilm stuff. Yeah, and upgrade everything. Yeah, so stupidly during that time when I'm rebranding um, to PT Collective, I then become a co-owner in De Novo Nutrition Supplement Company. Okay, so this is where we get into that bit. So I basically put 50 grand in and I get 50% ownership of the company. What, I, what subs? What type of subs? Whey protein, Utopia, like evidence-based wise mm. and like Ben Escro. There's no one out there that's better than him when it comes to like formulation. Um, and it was similar. There were similarities between us as shredded by science with the academy and being science-based and evidence-based and doing the right thing and De Novo as a supplement company. But the problems with that is that you're putting the right dosage in. So then for the cost of goods of... So at this time, my financial knowledge is this. I've got 100K in the bank, HMRC come at me. That was my financial knowledge. So he sent me over the stuff and I've gone, eh, I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. I don't know if it's... Uh, in terms of the formulation of the supplements? In terms of the business side of things okay. as well. So okay. I'm like, so and, that was, and that was the thing I've gone from, I used to say I get sex twice a year. That was like on March and August. When, you when, did we, done, intakes. when we did the intakes. So with supplements, I'm, I got into that. I was like, I'm going to invest in that. And I didn't take no money, no salary, no nothing. My thing was, Stupidly, we're going to get into it. And when we sell the business for 10 to 20 million, I'll get mine. So it's an exit play that you were hoping for, not a yeah. like dividend or salary no. or payout per sales. So as I've gone in, I've gone into it and we've, changed, we've made some good changes and stuff like that. But then it's like, it's a cash flow game as well. Like when you've got to keep funding stuff. Yeah. And then when you're looking physical at physical products, when you're so. doing your own uh, formulas and stuff like that, even with the manufacturer, you'll do a thousand SKUs. Mm, so that's, just a test that's, that's a pre-workout but that's one flavor mm. and that might cost $15 per skew yeah Whereas, plus a lot of them are not going to make it and be successful no because you're competing against if it was a smaller business it could it brought in okay numbers if it was that but it was never a business that had enough money to compete with the big boys so you think my pro in all the others they own the manufacturing oh yeah they've they've got the biggest influencers they've got they're already established, like you cannot compete with those. And my uh, partner used to work for my protein, my vegan, okay. project managing the SKUs. Yeah. So I know how much it costs yeah. to just test a SKU. Yeah. And it's not cheap. So you, it's that- You can burn through cash fast. It's that thing is you're always going to have best sellers. You always, whey protein doesn't have great margins. Yeah. But then you do it as more of a loss leader. So I just, I probably invested, and what, I, what we did then stupidly was- Ben had like part-time chicks and I already had like the core nucleus of the PTC SBS team. And we tried to have one team work over two businesses, but because... The supplement and PTC? Yeah. Okay. So you both have those two are your main focuses at that point. And I've got, we've got one team. Trying to do two completely And one you can businesses. sell every single day, the other one you couldn't. It's an intake. At the time. So it's completely opposite in terms of marketing yeah. intake revenue cash flow yeah confusing basically yeah extremely confusing and you've got one team working over two different businesses so basically what happened is on the last intake of the sbs academy we had a stupidly high number of people that signed up to the monthly so again i'm not on my finances at this point and money's coming in mm. but come 2019 september when the last monthly payments stopped coming in i'm losing like minus 30k a month minus 20k a month because we don't have this another SBS Academy intake. We're waiting until March or whenever it was for the PTC one. And because we're not doing a big intake, we had small little specialist courses. 
we launched, when I'm talking like we used to make 50K a night consistently, when we launched, we made 3,000 pounds. And I was like, what the absolute fuck? Because we're selling small little courses now. And there was no year long academy anymore. It was level two, level three. And if people want to do a level two, level three, so we, was, we had a real awkward phase where we was building out the courses. So our thing was, we just had like a coaching obesity uh, course. And I had just had, the money was going. So basically by having one team focus on that, I neglected the SBS slash PTC during that phase. And I was like, fuck, I need to get out. Like the business, the supplement company's not making, there's not enough in there, it's not gonna work. At that time I was like, it's not gonna work. And I like, I ne neglected my baby. And I'm like, if we keep going on. With the sub company. With the sub company. And I don't put all of my attention back on this company based on, again, we was, it was mass because the result you get, what you're getting today is all of the work you've done previously. Mm. So because there was, because we neglected that and put in focus on that and the business model and things changed and there wasn't another 50K a night, 185 people because we rebranded, that was, the worst probably year of my life in business sense, but I never lost sleep because that's just me. I feel like you have got to be a certain type of person to 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 run a company, and I just had to kill one thing off so the other thing didn't die. But by doing that, taking on that other company when I was nowhere near ready and it weren't a good fit, like numbers wise, nearly killed both businesses. So obviously, then we we started doing level two, level three. Business picked back up. And, uh, but then a year ago, so that's why I said like the only business that I feel fouled was De Novo. All the others were just pivoted. So like it just went into the SBS and then we rebranded. So they weren't really like a business as such. It's the same sort of thing. We just were pivoting with the times. She said academies are no longer academies. Qualifications are no longer qualifications. Conferences are no longer as appealing, mm -hmm. especially when they start going over to other European countries as well. So then a year ago, July 20, what are we on, 20, 2022, I just said to the team, I'm off. I'm taking a year off. There's no like going, because mo most, uh, most of them are subcontracted as well. And uh, I took a year off. The first few months I wanted to just play Call of Duty, but it's hard when you've got kids. And then I was just spent months either learning stuff I wanted to do and just go, what's my next move? What now? Because when you're in the game and you've got outgoings every single month and you've got a team, you can try and you can't get out of the situation and look at yourself from a bird's eye view and go, because you like you can give, I can give great advice to other people because I have no emotional connection to their business. And I can just take a step back and, and say, this is what we need to do. But then you know that, but when you've got that emotional connection and you're in that tunnel vision, and the overheads and the team. And the overheads. You can't make the right decisions because some decisions take time. Some decisions are not reversible. And when you've got to pay 40, 50K a month to just break even, it's hard to do that. So for me, it was clean slate. So when you stopped and you took this break, that business was dissolved? No. Nah, so the business is still there, but we stopped doing level two, level three. Okay. Because that was that, but that, at the time that was bringing in eighty to eighty-five percent of all of the revenue. But it also requires a lot of team to run it and deliver. It does, it. yeah. So you wanted to obviously close down the team or wind down the yeah. team so that you didn't have so such just responsibility. Like, yeah, and our thing was our terms and conditions were where you got a year to complete. Okay. So we had to stop to then for so at that time I'm then I'd like an assistant helping. Yeah. And then so the assessors doing the venues. And um, yeah, we just ended up making sure everyone got through their level two, level three, or as many people as possible. And then we just, so now PTC is just there for trainer education. There's no, which is easier to market. Mm. But then my thing now is going, what move do I want to make? How much time and energy do I want to put towards this versus my new thing, which is obviously the personal brand. So you take this time out. What was that like as someone that's used to running businesses, doing things, working with teams, and now you don't have that much responsibility anymore? Just time to think. How did you feel? Good and bad. Yeah. What was the What was the bad? Bad is I just was a dad. 
you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm my brain's like, tuh, 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 tuh. so, but I said, but that was my downside is a strength and a weakness. Cause it'd be like, right, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. But when you have a bigger team, it's harder to, to make those changes as, as we said. So the good thing was I could take a step back and because I didn't have staff and stuff like that. And now throughout the years of business, you learn as you go. You read books, you experience new things. So it's, when you're in working like that, you can't take a step back and go, I just started looking at my life and the different businesses and then going, what do I know now that I didn't know at the time? And what worked and what didn't work? And what do I like and what do I dislike? And what am I good at? So now I've had that time is going, well, this is what I like. And this is what I'm good at. So now I want to create the next phase of my life doing something that supports my likes and, and what I'm good at and anything that I'm not good at or dislike, I'm not going to do. So because you haven't got that pressure there, you can make the decisions. It gave me time to make decisions of my next route into, I suppose, the season of my life now where, as I said, the two biggest regrets I had is not building my personal brand and not taking money off the table. I, I, I was like the runt of the team where it'd be reinvest the money. Like you pay VAT and stuff like that. Yep. They weren't going to Dubai at this time, do you know what I mean? So um, with, with that taken into account, it was always reinvest it back in and I'll get mine when I'll get mine. And they're the two biggest regrets of like, just take money out. I could have taken a lot more money out of the business and yeah, I would have paid more tax, but I'd have more assets. Like I don't really have many physical assets, personal assets. So they're my two, two biggest regrets in the sense of I should have just built my personal brand because it didn't matter if it was shredded by science, PTC, EFM, de novo. I could have continued to grow my personal brand. So then whatever I did, as I got older or pivoted or launched something new, people would have bought into me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is the key thing for most personal trainers now because everyone has a customized training plan. Everyone has a nutrition. Everyone has a weekly check-in. So like, why are you different? Especially as there's more and more mentors now and there's more and more systems and making things easy. It's going, well, why am I going to pick Alex over someone else? So it's knowing who you are, embracing that and being intentional with it and only working, like being really specific. So you do stand out. What does a personal brand actually mean to you? Because like we said at the start, it's quite an ambiguous thing. And there may be people listening in on this conversation and going, these guys talking about personal branding. What the hell does that mean? What is personal branding, you know? Because like my definition might be different to yours and the audience's idea of what it is may be very skewed or completely wrong. So like, yeah. what does it mean to you? Like, I think the simplest term, and I'm more about trying to keep, keep it simple, but not as simpler than it needs to be. We can go into a bit more detail is purely it's just being, what would someone say about you? So if I said, right, Alex, list three to five things about Alex that you associate with him. Try It could be appearance. Yeah. Glasses. Glasses. Always wear samurai. Yeah. I've got a Labrador. Yeah. So it's like, what do you associate with him? Yeah. So it's you being intentional. It's basically you ask people and then you sit down and you go, what are the three to five things you want people to be associated with you? And if they're the same, good job. Just find, just get more people to know about you. If they're not the same, then you need to do something different. Mm. So branding is not just people think logos and fonts and stuff like that. When I, I break branding down into four different stages, in simple terms, it's going, what do people say about you behind your back? What do people associate with when they see your face? They see the glasses. It's about you, you molding what you want people to say. So if they're not the same, you've got to do something different. What do you need to do? So for me, if I want to work with people that are already making 10 grand a month and actually want to build personal brand, embrace automation with some artificial intelligence, they probably want to make money. So they've got to be aspir I feel like a lot of personal trainers just be happy with 5K just under the VAT threshold. Until they realize it. how little that does for your life. Yeah. Especially and with the cost of things right now, 5K doesn't get you anything. Yeah, and they're, they're only on social media and they're only posting content because they feel it's they have to, yep. to get clients. I don't want to work with those people. I like creating content. I want people that want to create content because they enjoy creating content 
and they want to make enough money. Now there's, that is me going, right, I'm going more specific with my niche and I'm going up market. It's so like different, you can like go broader, you could go more niche, you could go down market, up market, there's many things. And I'm going with my time off. I used to say I don't like people. And then Dan Osman would be like, I don't think you believe that, Luke. I think you just don't like a certain type of person. I was like, you're right. I like a young, ambitious Luke. The early days, the shredded by science day, the naive days when you didn't know what the hell you was doing. You didn't care. You just did stuff mm. and you got results. So it's like, I want to work with those people. But I don't want to work with a load of those people. But I don't need to work with a load of those people because I can charge more money. And I've got a phase of like, next step would be maybe, because I have been in the supplement game, rather than you like whoring yourself out for a sub to 5% commission on a supplement, why don't we build your personal brand? And if we get there, there's 11 ways to monetize your personal brand. Don't ask me what off the top of the head. It's like, why don't we bring out our own supplement range? So that would be like another phase of the business. And yeah, personal brand, you need to have brand purpose. So I break that down into your personal vision, your customer vision, and your business vision. Now, most people do, I used to think it was like wishy-washy, you read books, traction, and the e-myth and stuff like that. But the more I think about it, I feel like that's important. I like how you broke that down. But it always starts with personal. Yeah, because that's what drives everything. Yeah, because my thing would be like, what is your personal vision? And I've, all, that me personally, I've always found that hard mm. to be like, what is it? Because I always be like, what, why is it? And now I don't give a fuck. I don't need to know what why is. I just need to have a target. And that target just needs to be, this is my personal vision. Your customer vision is going, this is my personal vision, this is my business vision. So your person, your business vision, for me, should just make sure that you can live your personal vision. Yeah, it's if a you, vehicle. Yeah, it's like if you want a house abroad, you want a house abroad, cool. Yeah. Then but you the need to create a business. Needs to reflect it. Yeah, and I always be like, do you need to... I'd always be like, you don't necessarily need to create a company where it aligns with your own personal values, but I'm like, well, why not? Because it'd probably be more enjoyable. Mm. You'd probably enjoy the experience when shit hits the fan, you'd probably stick with it a little bit more. So it's about personal vision. How can I use the business vision to get me to fulfill my personal vision? And then the customer vision is going, well, who is it that I want to help? What's the target market? What do they need? Rather than creating a product and then trying to force it down someone's throat, you need to know who the target market is. So your customer vision is basically who it is you're trying to help to then make money that fits the business vision that then flows into your personal vision. So that's the first phase of brand. The next is brand positioning. So it's going, who is the target market, which coincides with the customer vision. But the customer vision is, I work with these types of people to achieve this result, and this is basically how I'm going to make my money. But when you're looking at brand positioning, you're picking who it is. Am I going to go after dads? Am I going to go after mums? Am I going to go after bodybuilders? It all depends. There's many different factors, which we won't go into of who you'd pick. And then it's going, who's your competitors? Knowing who they are. Who's serving that target market already? What do they do well? What do they not do well? How could I do something different? Why would they pick Alex over someone else? Mm. And you have to go through that. And people say there's no compet. I'm like, you need to know who your competitors are, but they can't take any of your focus or attention. So you need to know who they are and what they're doing so you can create something that's better or different. It doesn't necessarily have to be better or different. Better, it could just be different. But the branding makes you different. Exactly, because it's like- They can't copy your branding because they're probably going to be different. What's your logo? Your face. Yeah. And then after you've done your competitive analysis, it's going, where do I, what type of brand do I want? Because you could be fairly- loud you could be fairly brash so there's people like who target my target market now the people i want to work with but i'm like i'm these are my cards i'm 37 years of age i've got three kids i don't want a sports car i want a car with seven seats so how do i position myself compared to my competitors i'm the og of personal training i was doing online coaching before you was even allowed to be in the gym so I'm positioning myself as in not flash. I, I've got an Apple watch on. I ain't got a fancy car or anything like that. But so it's looking at where do you want to position yourself amongst the other people that are serving your target market? And then once you do that, you do your brand character. I've got a skin fade. I wear tracksuits. 
I've got a South East London accent. It's then being like, how do I want to come across? Do I want to be serious and boring? And this is the thing. If you're an accountant and you're now PT and you are actually boring, just be boring. Because there's plenty of those people in the world that you would appeal to as a coach. Yeah, everyone's going to vibe with with someone. But it's just, it's no, it's being intentional with how you come across. Yeah. Your messaging, your tonality, the words you use, your appearance. All of those things matter. Your, so it's like once you've got your brand character, it's going, what is, your, what is your message that you want to get across? How do you want to get that message across in regards to the brand voice? Because mm. you could be quite calm and philosophical or you could be quite loud and still knowledgeable. So it's just picking what do you want to be? And I, I always say, just be yourself, but probably just bump it up a bit. Yeah, because when you're on online, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. There's a lot of people there's a lot of like visual stimulus, right? And you've got to really like elevate yourself a little bit more than what you typically are in person in order to be heard. Because uh, I don't know if you still make YouTube videos or you make short form videos. Yeah. I imagine you have to crank yourself a little bit to convey the message the right way. And that's what I was taught when creating YouTube videos is take yourself and add, add some gain to it. Yeah, like just... increase some volume to your personality a little bit because what you think is enough is probably not enough when someone is watching it. So just like pump yourself up a little bit to try and get that through the screen. And I think yeah. that's really important to do. Yeah, because normally if you say I'm a, you think you're 10 out of energy, when you watch it back, you're a seven. Yeah. But I always use, going through like brand personality, so with the thing, I'll do like a personality slider, so that would be like serious and funny. So like where do you want to fit within the brand? Yeah, but you're then, more like cheeky chappy. Yeah, but side. then there's a fine line between if you've got to be a certain way, if you want to be taken seriously, you can't be the cl like the joke the clown. all of the time. So yeah. it, it, I use it as like a, I'm not a DJ or anything like that. We know with like a slider, you're just going, where do you want to go? Mm. With different things, tempo and tone of voice or serious or knowledgeable or contrarian or whatever it is that you just put two opposing values and you're just going, where do I want to fit? And then only then do you look at brand identity. And that comes into who you are. And that's why I say probably the best target market is you a few years ago. Because you already have that, what you used to search, what you used to think about, what you, your desires and stuff like that. That's probably the best target market if you can do that. And then when you're looking at brand identity, I'm going, well, what fonts? I don't, if I just, imagine me having like a squiggly line font, like a real feminine font, you know, like, oh. That was the first thing that came to mind when you exactly. said feminine. So I'm just going, I need powerful font. Mm. I need, why am I picking these colors? Because they mean something to me. I like these colours. I'm picking those colours. What? Um, why have I got the OG logo? Because I'm the fucking OG. Do you know what I mean? I want people to associate. So it's only at the, the full phase where you're looking at that. And that's where you're taking into your own, your own yourself. But then you're also taking into account your target market. Because how do you want people to perceive you? Yeah, because you've got to think of two people. You can't just think There's of the yourself. There's the personal vision and the customer vision. Especially because typically if you're trying to market to someone, you're ahead of them. Yeah. So you can't like market to the same level. You've almost got to come down a couple of levels in order to appeal to, like you said, where they were, or sorry, where you were and where they are yeah. and meeting them at that level whilst also having that aspirational level that exactly. they want to get to in your content. Indeed. So yeah, I think that, I think that answered personal brand. What basically. personal brands have you seen out there? maybe in the fitness space or other spaces that, that you really like and think have done a good job. Because I think it'd be cool for people who are listening to this to like understand what a good personal brand looks like. You must have some people that you look at. Because like when I think personal brand, I'm thinking Conor McGregor. Yeah. You're right, Irish, he's got proper 12. He's quite um, obnoxious, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's got a potty mouth. Like he's yeah. got a clear personal brand. He's cheeky. He's a showman. He's an entertainer. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, like he's got this this swagger about him. Like that's a good personal brand in my opinion. He's really leaned into who he is, mm -hmm. but he's also made it larger than life. Yeah, I feel like he's elevated himself because yeah. he has to because he's an entertainer. But he's made hundreds of millions off the back of that brand. And that's why I hear sell the the, the biggest pay per views in the UFC are him. Yeah. So to answer that question, it doesn't matter who I feel because I will have a certain type of flavor. I would like it. So I love Conor McGregor. Yep. I like a guy called Digital Jeff, where he puts on his shades. I like Dr. Disrespect. Yeah. 
because okay. it's my preference. Is he like a gamer? gamer? Yeah. Yeah. So like it, he will dress up. But he's, okay, without me being into gaming, mm -hmm. his, this is a good example of personal branding because I know nothing about this guy, never watched his content. Yeah. But from my memory, just of like you saying that, I, f I see someone with a moustache. Yeah, the Ethiopian caterpillar. That's classic personal brand where he's imprinted a vision it's of himself. consistency. In me, and I don't watch his content. Yeah. I just know the name because it's quite unique and a moustache. So for me, I don't really look at fitness people because mm. they're not my type. Like they're, I don't, if you, people, the easiest stereotypical one would be James Smith. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? deficit. But again, I'm not his target market. Mm. So he shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. I look at more people in business. I look at more like my, I love my thing is people, like, as you said, people might like, I post on my stories about UFC. People yep. then go, Luke is this. And that's the beautiful thing about personal brand is that there will be personal elements to that and how you stand out. There'll be other people that I'm into gaming. I stopped for a period of time, but I started back up again. So it's going, Luke does this. There's other people that does that. But I'm into UFC and I'm into gaming, so I feel like I have more of a connection with Luke. Hence why I'd pick him as a coach, mentor, whatever you, word you want to give it. So I feel like the person you, the personal brand doesn't matter if you're brash and loud. That's who I like people. And I feel like if you, if I had to say you had to be a certain way to make it, you're probably going to have to be more that way. You don't have to be, but it depends on how big you want to make it. And why do those people stick out? Because they're loud. They're larger. But you've got to back it up as well. Yeah. Like Connor's still got to be able to fight. Because mm -hmm. if he if he couldn't fight and he was just a personality, he wouldn't have gotten the UFC. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's based on your preference because there's other people that will hate him. It's interesting we're having this conversation because three of the guests that we've done, actually two of the guests, you being the third, have all talked about this, about the individual behind the product, behind mm -hmm. the service, and how it's much easier to be different than it is to be better. Yeah. So you could be comparably exactly the same in terms of what you deliver, but very different in terms of how you come across, and that's what's gonna dictate your success. And I have these conversations with my clients, and I say, everyone's sharing tips, recipes, advice, and posting results. Doesn't make you different. Mm -hmm. What makes you different is being yourself, but I think a lot of people struggle with sharing that side of them on social or leaning into it or being open enough to to share it or they maybe think it's not relevant like i should i don't need to share that i just need to show that i know my stuff and that i can get results and i think like going into 2024 and i think you'll agree that it's more important than ever because we're in an information world right now people don't want just information they want to connect with an individual who they relate to or vibe with or understands them and um, yeah, I just keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Personal brand, be you, shine through. Yeah, and I would say you could even have an inferior service and keep clients longer because you've got personal Connection, brands. Relationship. Yeah, you think the bit stronger your personal brand and the bigger your, I use like brand equity. So it's not just the size, it's actually how, how can you influence people to buy something or do something. Mm. So there's plenty of people that just get likes or followers because they've got a nice body. But I'm like, you probably shouldn't try and sell one-to-one -one coaching because you've you've got no like, but you probably haven't got enough trust for that person to know that you'd be good at coaching. But the so the bigger your brand or bigger your brand equity, you have a larger following, means you get more leads, means you get a higher conversion rate on sales calls, means even if you've got an inferior product or service, they will stay longer because you've got fan boys and fan girls. Mm, and you really get like more it. opportunities. Yeah. It's kind of like these guys on YouTube who do vlogs. Yeah. Like they can sell anything. Yeah, well, you hear it all the time with like these social media get-togethers where you'd go there and people that have got a TikTok account with millions and millions and they're, they're in a room, they've got no one in there, someone with less subscribers on YouTube, they've packed it out because there's a one-two punch. You need short form and long form content. Yeah, get Short form gets you content. attention yeah. and awareness and it's more discoverable. But then I feel like you've got the podcast. Yeah, exactly why I do it. One, selfishly to, to learn, connect, build relationships, but also because I know there's gonna be certain people in my audience who like the short form and they go, hey, I wanna go a little bit deeper and, and know more about this person or wanna see what else they've got to say. And you can only really get to know me or you in this setting. Yeah, You can't really see who Luke is 
in short form because it's very polished and it's very like it has to be to the point. It has to be to the point, right? Because you're just doing it to get attention. But in the longer form stuff, they really get to know who you are, like yeah. the uncut, unedited uh, version of you, which I think is really important. And a lot of people overlook that. They're like, yeah, I just create more reels. Yeah, and you just got to look at it as the content unit and what they can consume. So you think if this is an hour long podcast and I'm doing 60 second reels, they're going to be less than that. That's a lot of reels and you're expecting someone to see every single reel that you've got just like you're just someone gives up a time an hour of their time to listen to a podcast there's there's less people listening to it but there's far more of a connection and if you are selling a service which is a higher price they're gonna have to feel like they they know who you are so like people will come up to me well when i was doing my prep series they're like body power and i'm like i don't know who the fuck you are but you know everything about me because I've documented that journey. Yeah. And, and you've given the opportunity to get you get to know you through that content that yeah, you've got there. Indeed. Love it. Where can people find more about you? Just go to like Instagram. That's my main one at the moment. Just Luke Johnson, PTC. Okay. And I'll put out content there. And yeah, that's probably the best place. Awesome. Cheers, brother.